was the summer of 2014, and for my son's bar mitzvah present, just like many Jewish parents, we wanted him to bond with the Holy Land. Oh, it worked perhaps too well. My husband had stayed back at the hotel, and our friends, my son and I, had just stopped in a pharmacy. Run! Run to the bomb shelter, sweetie! Please! Please hurry! I didn't hear the sirens at first, but the Israelis did. They're used to hearing these things. We ran to the back of the storeroom. It was a 12 foot by 24 foot windowless bomb shelter. My heart's pounding. Boom! Boom! I hear and feel the percussion of the exploding bombs. I'm trying not to get sick. I look at my 13-year-old son and I think I'll never forgive myself if something happens to him. That's an excerpt from a speech I gave to the Orange County Jewish Bar Association. It was the first but not the last time we had to run to a bomb shelter. Our adventure and my transformation is also the subject of my book, Blasted from Complacency, A Journey from Terror to Transformation in Israel. There is no chapter in a parenting book on what to do when a war starts and you're on a family vacation. Think touring extraordinary and sacred sites mixed with cowering in bomb shelters. I'm still trying to get over the Jewish guilt of taking my son to war for his bar mitzvah present. The impact of being human targets helped me understand the plight of Israelis living like this, and it also made me want to work on peace. How Israel is often described on the news is not what I'd seen with my own eyes, and I felt Palestinian parents also preferred their children playing safely in their backyards. The missiles exploded just near enough to blow apart my world as I knew it, forever changing me, and you'd never recognize my life today with what it was like then. I believe I found my life's purpose. So, hello everybody. Uh, welcome to Peace with Penny. Uh, I'm really looking forward to speaking with Roz today. Her family history of how they came to live in Israel portrays the experiences of so many Jewish families seeking a safe haven in Israel. And we'll get to their story shortly. Raz Konez is an Israeli born in a suburb of Beersheba. After attending a religious high school, she later joined the Israeli military and helped establish two intelligence departments. After her military service, she was introduced to Rabbi Froman, um, may his memory be a blessing, and his family, who were famous peace activists in Israel. She became very close with them. Working to advance coexistence between Israelis and Palestinians, Ross founded the youth group at Ruth Shorashim Juder, a peace organization also located in the West Bank. The high school group of Israelis and Palestinians worked together sharing their identities and discussing the issues of the times. Please remember, if you missed any of the episodes of Peace with Penny, they're on my website at pennyst.com under podcasts. So now I'm excited to learn more about Roz's important peace work in Israel. Roz, welcome. Thank you so much, Penny, for the opportunity. Um, Good morning. <laughs> morning. You were born in Maytar, a suburb of Beersheba. What was that like growing up there? Um, first of all, very beautiful. <laughs> it's area, it's a southern area of the um of the, the mount the mountains of Hebron mm -hmm. uh, and the Judea Desert. Uh, so first of all, it's very, very beautiful. Um, and I actually I was I was raised in the suburb of Erber Sheva, it's uh, in the Negev, um, to immigrant parents who were the second generation uh, of Holocaust survivors, my grandparents. And they sat down in, in the, they live in the Negev idealistically. Um, my father's hero is Ben Gurion. <laughs> and bo both of them, um, they actually grew up, uh, they, they came as immigrants uh, and they grew up abroad. They just came here in their 20s. Um, and, I, and I feel for me, it was, uh, I, I felt it uh, very much in our in our home, the, the Zionist ideology, um, the idea of, of choosing to live here, not not being born, 
just born to the situation and, and the deep connection to the land. From the, the, the Holocaust, they went to, I believe it was Canada, was it? My, for my mother's side, Canada, for my mother's yes. side, Greece. Yes, and could you just talk a little bit, how did they get to Israel eventually? My parents? I, I, I believe yeah. your grandparents and then your parents. Actually, my well, my my grandparents from my um, my mother's side, they were a, after the Holocaust. They were very young, and actually, they came first to Israel. They were here right. when right. Israel was established. Right. And they, right. just later on, uh, they had an opportunity to meet up with the family, like this distant family from uh, that that uh, lived in Canada, and offered to help them out. So they went to Canada, and and for my mother, I will say. It was very clear, like go, growing up in a in a Holocaust survivor family, uh, for her, for her it was clear that if she, if, if her choice is to be a Jewish and to live a Jewish life, she wants to do it in Israel. So already, and when she was eighteen or nineteen, she made an Aliyah for the first time, and then she went to study for a few years in Canada. She came back, but for her it was clear that if if she wants to create a Jewish family, it's going to be in Israel. Um, and it was uh, definitely for ideological reasons. Um, and for her, it was a big sacrifice to come that age, leave her family, her brother. It wasn't that easy. Um, and, but uh, but uh, that, that was the reason. Um, and, and for my father's side, uh, he came uh, actually after living uh, until he was 28 in Greece uh, and he came with his brother uh, to study here and then he came upon the ideology of Ben Gurion and uh, he had the opportunity to invest in he's an art uh, he's an architect and mm -hmm. they had the opportunity to to um, establish uh, ecological architecture in the Negev and for him it was like fulfilling the Zionist dreams that that also he felt very connected to and they met here. <laughs> that's that's just such you you hear these stories of of what feels like you know building the Israeli dream and it's it's so great to be able to I really uh, appreciate your family's story. Um, now, I know you went to an Orthodox girls' school, and I was amazed. You speak a number of languages. How many languages do you speak? Uh, right now, four. <laughs> well, that's, that's a lot. That's a lot. Um, I, I grew up with Hebrew and English because of my mother, and, um, and later on, Spanish and Arabic is the most recent project of my life. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Uh, most Israelis in the West Bank live close to Palestinians, but they never interact. When when you were growing up, did did you interact with them? No, actually, not at all. Um, I grew up in a school, a religious school, a dormitory school for girls. Um, most of my friends were our settler friends from uh, uh, the southern part of uh, Hebron and uh, from Gush Katif. Then it was just. Uh, exactly the time when I was, I think, in uh, 11th grade or 10th grade. So uh, they evacuated Gush Katif, so that was a big issue. Mm. And, and I have never even thought about, I didn't, I didn't even have the desire or the thought about meeting the other side, meeting Palestinian people. For me, they were the enemy, and that was clear. And I will say that at the same, that, how saying that, that my, my parents who, and, and that is something that I want to, to put an emphasis on, they, they saw the devastating consequences of racism towards their parents and, and they fought for peace all their lives. And even in it, when it was considered unacceptable in the religious society in which they lived. And, and for me, I remember myself as a, as a religious young teenager in the Zionist uh, religious uh, society, uh, sometimes even a little bit ashamed for their, for their uh, um, point of view of the situation of the conflict, and I was kind of 
not I, I never talked loudly about about what I heard at home because uh, I was afraid it will offend my my settler friend. Yeah, that it, a much more. I mean, kids that age always kind of want to be independent from their parents, but but you had uh, societal reasons why <laughs> you didn't want to uh, be like them, at, at least at that point in your life. Um, after graduating high school, you went into the army for almost five years. What what years were those? And and can you tell us a bit about your army experience, please? Yeah, of course. Well, first of all, I will say it's not very often that uh, religious girls go to the army, but that was my rebellious part of my life. I was like, <laughs> <laughs> I, I knew it's gonna make my principal angry. So and so I thought it was uh, very cool to go to the army. Um, and later later on, I also find I found the ideological reasons, <laughs> mm -hmm. but. Um, and and uh, I even though I attended this religious Zionist school, I, when I it was clear for me I want to join the army, and that's the best uh, the best way for me to prove loyalty to my nation. And my, my first job as an 18 year old soldier was observing the borderline on the West Bank border, and my job was to to prevent from hostile trespassers from entering Israel to the settlement in the region. And I sat for hours and hours in front of a screen. It was very, very difficult. And and, and I saw how those trespassers, I saw them as small black dots on the screen. Mm. And, and my clear perception um, was that every single dot on the screen I saw was a potential terrorist. That was clear to me. I knew that just a few months before I started my job there, one of those small black dots jumped over the fence and attempted to shoot a pregnant woman right. and I know many people from the settlement in that area and I could easily imagine uh, one of my friends or family in the same place where that woman was shot so so that is how I treated those black dots of course I mean day and night I called the armed forces and led them to the area I recognized on the screen that was about to be trespassed and the 18 year old soldiers like me the uh, combat fighters of course they believed exactly like me and like every other soldier almost in Israel, and that those people are potential terrorists and they treated them according, accordingly. And sometimes I also, I saw, I saw a very violent uh, um, situations, but, but for me, it was clear that this is uh, the price we need to pay for, for uh, to defend our people. Did the, and, I'm sorry. Sorry. To, to no, defend people, I mean, like for security, for security reason. And um, maybe I can share another experience I had as a soldier. Sure. Uh, yeah, it was uh, almost almost five years. <laughs> about most of the things I've done, I can't really talk about here, but my army service wasn't very easy. And, and I felt I was sacrificing the most beautiful years of my life. And I faced the question, why, why, am, why am I doing this? And I answered with a story I heard in the very first days of the army while visiting the Yad Vashem Holocaust Museum. That's mm. something that you do, you take like the young soldiers and it's, you feel very patriotic. And I remember that I, we had a lecture there from this organization that supports the IDF. And he said that it was, it was a, um, a young man that used to be a combat fighter. And he said that he, caught a Palestinian man with explosives on his body uh, that was about to prosecute an attack um, on his way out from a central uh, bus station. And that was weird for him because he he said, why, why are you on the way out? You were already inside. You already managed to go in. Why didn't you uh, take on the attack? And, and the answer stated that he wanted to share with us that, that he didn't proceed with the attack because he saw soldiers going on the bus and he just got terrified and he wanted to flee and that was very strong for me because I was like looking at myself with this olive green uh, uniform and 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 I remembered that I was proud to wear that uniform for me it was a symbol of pride I mean I looked at, at the holocaust pictures around me I imagined my grandparents I looked at myself I looked at my army document which I carry I carry everywhere and it 
And on every army document, it says I'm serving my mandatory service in the IDF. And I thought to myself, this is not mandatory for me. This is a privilege. This is something that I am, I am proud of. And my desire to, to continue to contribute to my country pushed me to proceed to officer scores. And I became an officer in the combat support of intelligence department. And then I moved to the to intelligence corps and I, and I did all kinds of uh, jobs over there. Um, and eventually that also what is what uh, drove me to meet Rabbi Fruman. Uh, did you, you yeah. I was wondering, you know, cause I, I know that you were working in the area, you have family, you had friends. Did that put extra pressure on you because you felt like their lives were in your hands? Yes, totally. I mean, this is what I, I woke up every morning and I thought to myself that, I mean, this is worth it. And all these hours in front of the screen, all this time in officer's course, I mean, this is worth it because it's for, for my family and friends. So um, I kind of would like to get an idea of, of how, what types of terrorist attacks and how many, how often, what, what during that time period was, was it uh, an active time when there are lots of terrorist attacks or occasional or, because the area, I mean, like, you know, the West Bank, is, is usually quite active, unfortunately, but at, at that age, at your age, then maybe it wasn't, I don't know. Well, I mean, I just, I recruited to the army and then, uh, the Oferet Yetsuka Award. I don't remember what's, uh, what's its name uh, in 2008. Um, mm -hmm. So that is when I just entered as a really, really young soldier. So I didn't really participate in it, but this is, was like, it gave me a sense of a, of a alarming feeling uh, to my, a sense of alarm to, to what I'm supposed to do. Mm -hmm. And during my service in the West Bank, I also, I, I, we had, had uh, I think, two terrorist attacks uh, during my service there. It was 10 months. Mm -hmm. And it's something pretty common. I can say also now, like, uh, working with Roots. So every two, three months, there is some. Okay. Uh, what, one thing that began to change you was that while you're in the Army, you, you began to realize how much you actually didn't know. Can you explain what, what you meant by that? Yeah, um, well, that came later on. I mm. think it was, uh, uh, when, when I was on my first job as an officer, so I got a job as to be a head of a training course of young soldiers recruited to the intelligence department. Mm -hmm. And I, I taught them a, about the history of the conflict. And that, that was like the point where I, where I started to understand. I, I prepared the lessons and I started to read a lot of books and, mm -hmm. and essays. And for the first time, I acknowledged how much I did not know. I was, and I, and I was eager to learn more. Mm -hmm. I understood mm -hmm. that th these are things that I never talked about them during my time in school. And a religious school, of course, or religious uh, young girls school, they, we, don't, we didn't talk about the history of the conflict. And I kept reading more and more and I really became very enthusiastic for about the, of this subject. And and while I I researched this for my, for my lessons, I came upon yeah, an article writing about uh, Rabbi Fuhrman, Rabbi Menachem Fuhrman. Uh huh. And he's an Israeli Orthodox rabbi and a peacemaker uh -huh. right. and a negotiator. And he had close ties with Palestinian religious leaders. And he was both a founding member of Gush Emunim and served as a chief rabbi of Tkwa. And for me, it was like Tkwa is a settlement in the West Bank and how can these things come together? It was surreal. Mm -hmm. How does an ideological uh, Zionist settler believe in peacemaking? I mean, how, how can that be? How did this, uh, where, where did he derive this uh, courage to meet the great Palestinian leaders? And, and also I was very curious, I really wanted I was fascinated and I wanted to meet him. I wanted to hear about his meetings with all those. I mean, for me, those great Palestinian leaders um, are, uh, uh, were like famous people. I mean, I read, I read all about them all the time. 
while mm -hmm. like while they, while making my lessons and and leading this course. Sorry. You you stayed in the military longer than was required. Why did you stay so long? Um. Well, I think I mean the my the first time was because I was curious. Uh, I was I was uh, I just felt I entered the army and my job as a observer on the, on the borderline. Uh, I felt I I didn't really feel the army. I didn't really feel I I uh, gave as much as I can give. I felt I have more potential um because it was like being a soldier in the army it doesn't it doesn't it's not a lot it, it is responsibility but it's not a lot of responsibility and and then they offered me to go to officers course and especially in the intelligence departments and it was for me an opportunity i felt wow now i can really do something that was mm. the, the mm. first uh, idea that came to my head and mm. later on mm. i think i felt um a lot of a lot sense of, sense of, of of meaning and capability mm -hmm. and uh, and i felt i i'm important i find, i think this is something maybe many soldiers and officers and uh, can uh, maybe relate to uh, that that uh, in very young age you you get a lot of responsibility and it is clear why you wake up in the morning. It is clear that what I'm doing, that all this effort, all this hard work is for a good cause, for an important cause. And I think this is what made me stay. <laughs> and did, I really loved my job. I loved what I did. Did the military change your perspective on life? Uh, sorry? You, did the military change your perspective on life? Um, in certain aspects, I think, well, maybe in many aspects. It, um, first of all, it, it it made me feel that I can do anything. I mean, the sense of capability, and, and this is something maybe later on I will connect to this, but mm -hmm. it also gave me the sense of capability when I went wanted to establish the Roots Youth Group. Right. Because uh -huh. uh, I felt, here, look, I mean, I, I'm so young and I'm doing this, uh, such huge and meaningful things. Um, it connected to me to very inspiring and interesting people. Right. And, and, uh, Can you, you talk, you're just, I, I know you can't talk about what you did in the intelligence service, but could you kind of tie that together with when, when you say the important things you were doing to, so people could understand a little bit, because you started out saying that there wasn't, you didn't feel there was much responsibility when you were younger, but I know that you were doing some really important things, not that you could tell any details, but can you tie those things together, your change of perspective of, of I mean, you, you established, uh, you know, some really important parts of the military and all that, and I, I think, um, Later on, you use some of those skills, I, I think, probably at Roots, but um, can you tie those together a little bit more? I oh. mean, can you can you maybe clarify? Um, just that, that I was looking for, is it possible to frame what you were doing uh, without really talking about it? In, in, like you're setting up two organizations intelligence units and you were you were in charge and so on um how yes, I, how how you learned really kind of organizational management skills by on the job training really so i mean i'll try maybe i don't i tell me if i understood you right i mean i i feel that my army service gave me a um, a sense of it, independence and the ability to establish things from zero and yeah. um, that that would be the point i mean I, they asked me in the army sometimes they say okay i don't care that you're like 21 years old there's a department that we need you to establish nobody knows how to do it figure it out mm -hmm. and there's nobody to look up to and to ask but how am i supposed to do it sometimes you just need to to understand how to do it and and i think that that helped me understand that also things that people could not imagine before um, if uh, you have 
the motivation and the drive, you can do it. And I think this is very important, especially today in the peace field. I mean, to understand that also things that nobody has done before, that nobody could imagine before, it's possible to create them from zero. And Again, this is a very big tool. Very I, I, yeah, I, I guess I think that part is really important. It's uh, uh, something that I speak about uh, when I speak to people that, uh, I mean, I could really relate to it. Um, you know, uh, when I decided to write my book after our experience in 2014, I had no idea how to write a book, but I, I know how to research and I know how to find out how to do things. And so I did and, and, and to speak and, and all these things, you know, I think in people's general way of looking at things, when they have to approach something new that they've never done, there's a lot of fear. And I guess I believe in experience in talking about examples like yourself, like myself, that, you know, it's, I used to run marathons and I always say that it's one foot in front of the other. And as long as you stay vertical, you're going to get there. And, uh, you know, I think it's an important thing to look at uh, what we do that we don't know. It, you know, you may discover that that's your favorite thing. You know, that you never had the experience before, but now that you really love. So I would encourage people to try new things. And uh, I know that you became very uh, close with the Froman family. Can you, they, and they have, have uh, such a unique uh, and wonderful view of peacemaking. Um, if you could go a little bit more into that. Yeah, I will. Um, this also was it came in stages. I mean, the first the first time I met Rabbi Fruman was actually two years after I first uh, connected his son. I, when I uh, when I just started teaching, so I connected the, his son and I asked him if I can meet his father, and he said, "Listen, it's not the best time. He just got sick with cancer," and. Uh, and he told me that I can come only on Sundays. They had the weekly sessions at his house. And at first, I mean, my first two jobs in the army were very, very intense. So I couldn't find myself like going on, off on Sundays to see Rabbi Fruman. And only in my last job that was in a more elite unit that had, it was, it was mostly officers. And so my evenings were free. And I thought, okay, maybe I can, I can, I can, I can still meet Rabbi Fruman. I, I, I wanted to see. I mean, I figured he's. Uh, I saw that he's still alive and he still gives uh, these weekly sessions at his house. And at first, what, what was funny, I, I didn't even learn about the conflict. I learned Kabbalah, I learned Zohar. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and and uh, but but this in, the interaction with his family was very, uh, very meaningful for me. And in that same year, a few months after I started participating in those lessons, um, Rabbi Fruman uh, has passed away. And I think what stayed with me the picture was the picture of his funeral. I mean, when I saw their Arab sheikhs, settlers, secular, ultra-Orthodox people crying over together over, over his death. And, and that day I realized I mean, how crazy this is. And I, and, I, and I remember feeling that my path was tied with the way of the Fruman family for good. And I was there for the Shiva and then I stayed in close connection with, the, with the, his wife, with his children. Mm -hmm. And actually after I finished my army service, uh, um, so I still, I still stayed in con contact with them. And, and actually, uh, it, it wasn't even, it was a, f a few years after, after the first time I, uh, I have met them. Um, after I traveled South America, after I worked two years as in a pre-military academy, I mean, and, and that I came up to Adassa, his, uh, his wife, and I asked her if I can help uh, maybe get involved in her peace, in, in her peace activism. And that is when 
uh, roots came into my life. Yeah. Very cool. We'll, we'll get to that in 2014, which was a very special year for me because that was the year of our trip to Israel. And it was actually um, the beginnings of Operation Protective Edge, but totally uh, changed my life. And uh, I know you were, your boyfriend was a tunnel expert and, and very much I was, I became familiar with the tunnels and how the Palestinians were shooting up the missiles from the tunnels uh, and my best friend uh, Iron Dome would blow them up in the sky and you'd wait 10 minutes till the shrapnel fell to the ground and, and all that, everything that changed my life. But um, you had, uh, I didn't know how uh, fast I could get away from the situation. I know of everybody in our group, I thought we were going from there to France and I thought a few more days on the Champs-Élysées was a good idea instead of running to bomb shelters. But um, when in 2014, when that all started and you were worried about your boyfriend uh, who was a tunnel expert, you, you had a different idea of what to do. What can you talk about what you did in, in yeah. 2014? <laughs> That was a crazy time. I mean, it was, um, Ashley was planning in that summer to go on holiday after almost five years in the army and another year in pre-military academy. I, I felt I really need a break. And then, uh, and then, uh, Operation Protective Edge broke out. And as you said, uh, my boyfriend was an, an officer and an expert in the tunnel, uh, in the field of tunnels. And we haven't spoken a word between us for two weeks. And I was very very anxious i i remember i was so afraid i mean every day they gave more and more names of soldiers who have died during the war and i couldn't sit at home quietly i felt i have to to do something so i volunteered um to the department where i've i've been last in, in the intelligence department and i i called my my officer there and i asked if i can recruit uh, as a reserve soldier and a reserve officer and uh, and he said yes yes we need you come and and that was the only way to make it's it's crazy but just by participating in the war that was my only way to feel calm because i felt okay now i know what's going on it's not i'm not i, I want to see the behind the scenes of the war and um was a difficult experience because I mean it was it was I think it became clear to me um, that that no matter what we do we will not prevent the next war but we will just delay it and that every day more and more soldiers are announced dead and hundreds of Palestinians are killed and hurt by bombing in Gaza again again and again and and I felt like I mean it's an it's a never ending blood cycle and. When the when the war ended, I mean, I was I was drained. I felt, I mean, no motivation, no energy, and and uh, the the year after after that war was one of the hardest years of my life. I mean, I was I was just so tired. <laughs> but, then you uh, took off. You, you told me yeah. to as far away as you could get. So can you talk a little bit about <laughs> that adventure? Yeah, so like every, like, like most Israelis, after their army service, that is always intense. Everybody in, uh, in their own uh, personal story and personal way. So by the end of that year, I, I just flew to, as you said, the other side of the world, to South America. And at first I thought, okay, I'll go for two months and then I'll be okay. And I remember that by the end of that, those two months, I just felt, I mean, I, I can't, I can't go back. And I canceled my, uh, my ticket back and I just left it open. And, and, I, and I left all options open. And but also the option of coming back. And I, and I was seeking for peace, <laughs> but a different kind of peace. I was seeking for inner mm -hmm. peace. I believe that I would find it in the high high mountains of Peru and Bolivia. <laughs> um, 
Did you? Did. No, <laughs> it actually it wasn't there. <laughs> mm. um, it was a big. It was a. Uh, it's a big a big lesson for me because I learned that actually the places. I mean, after traveling, I was like on the highest mountains, traveling back and forth every day, every week, and I just I got tired. And I, and I felt I'm, I'm kind of doing the same thing I've done in Israel, like this intense life, taking responsibility. I was working, studying, and I and I decided to take a break. And, and I went into a Peruvian community and I started living there in a small town. And I felt and this was like a, a, a moment of change for me. I mean, mm-hmm. I think I'd be being raised as a religious um, a Jewish girl. So there's a lot of fear from other faiths, after other cultures, other religions. And it's, 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 I mean, a lot of uh, ceremonies or beliefs. I mean, that my instinct was, was to run away, but I was so tired and I, and I really needed a home and this community took me in. So I was like, okay, so I'm here. And I think it, it, I discovered how enriching it is to be an in interfaith uh, interaction. I mean, I learned that that actually sharing, I was sharing my religion. I was like showing them Shabbat and co- what is, and I explained what's kosher. And, and, and I felt, I mean, they, were, they even understood me more than secular people understand me. They were like, okay, this is your ceremony. These are your rules. And this, these are ours. And, and I felt that we, it was an opportunity to enrich and learn from each other. Mm-hmm. And that my strong sense of identity was a tool for connection and, and not a tool for separation or for conflict. And once I got the fear out, out of the system, so everything looked different. And, and that is where I found peace. That is where like inner peace and also <laughs> later on, it will lead me to also the, the search for, for larger circles of peace. But I understood that maybe um, the, the life in Israel is it, it might be not, not as peaceful as in, it is in South America, but, but maybe this thing, this, uh, this, this sense of uh, understanding that, that different interactions uh, with, with uh, different religion is something that I want to do. And I don't want to do it in South America. I want to do it in my homeland. Mm-hmm. Uh, I didn't, as I say, okay, maybe it might be not as beautiful, it might be not as... Uh, it's quiet, but it, it's my home. And, and I want to bring my new understandings there. And I want to fix there what is wrong. And I want to influence reality where I come from. And and there, there was a friend I, uh, I traveled with and uh, she, taught, she taught me something that really stayed with me. She said that her father always said that it's not a big effort to be water in the river, but if you had the privilege to find water, take it to the desert where water is rare. And, and, and that was like, okay. I'm going back mm. and uh, yeah and that was the reason for coming back <laughs> so let's talk about my favorite favorite peace group in the world Ruth Shorashim <laughs> Juder and how uh, you kind of touched on how you got involved with them with a Fruman uh, with Khrasa who um, is part of the team there um, so let's talk about Roots and, and, and what they do and your high school group you established between Israelis and Palestinians. Yeah, um, so as I said in the beginning, I mean, um, when, I, when I came back from South America, so I went to visit Adassa and uh, I asked her if she has anything for me to do. <laughs> yeah. At, yeah. And actually she, she put me in connection with a young um, Israeli settler from Efrat, a 17-year-old guy mm-hmm. named Eden Riskin. And, and I met with him because Adassa said, I was like, okay, yeah, I'll meet <laughs> <laughs> no problem. And uh, he told me, let go. I mean, I wanted something else from Hadassah, but now that you came along, <laughs> I, I, I'm just looking for somebody to help me establish a youth group Mm-hmm. in Gush Etzion mm-hmm. that involves Palestinian and Israelis. And of course that sounded surreal. And I, I told him, I, I mean, I don't know. I was like th- thinking about something 
small to help out, I don't know, volunteering a day or two. And he's like, no, come and establish this program. And I told him, I, I don't think I will have time for this, but he convinced me to come to, to what, one meeting just to have a look. <laughs> and when I came to the say, small land, the farm of uh, the Abu Awad families, uh, I saw uh, six or seven uh, young, uh, young Israeli and Palestinians uh, sitting there. And Ed then introduced me as, as the founder of the Coming to Be Youth Group of Roots. <laughs> <laughs> That was subtle. <laughs> yeah, he, he kind of made it clear that that's what's going to happen. <laughs> yeah. And I remember, I mean, it was it was all surreal. So I was like, okay, wh whatever you said, but and, okay, so so I'm doing this, I guess. And I looked around and I saw a young a young man my age named Chadi Abu Awad. Mm -hmm. uh, maybe some of you may know him. Yes. Uh, and, and I asked him to be my, my ally, my friend. As I understood, I have obviously can't establish a group like this on my own. And uh, together with another Israeli guy and another Palestinian partner uh, with Waji and uh, Jamal and, and uh, other activists in Roots. But it, but it was uh, mainly like we were the core, like me, Shadi and Yakir, it's a three uh, musketeers <laughs> the same age. and. <laughs> taking on this crazy this crazy mission and we started uh, this uh, joint journey with um, an amazing team partners and uh, and this uh, journey will conclude soon to almost five years I mean uh, mm. it's crazy to think that it ha it's already five years and and uh, we started uh, with uh, as I said like six or seven young people and we finished at this at this first year we already finished with 30 and the next year we mm -hmm. had another 30 and then we went to Switzerland and we came back and we had different seminars and workshops and uh, slowly and and surely but but together I, it's important for me to say it the whole establishment of the idea and the program happened together with the youth themselves I mean I was I used to sit with them and I was like okay I'm not a settler and I'm not young so you tell me what you need <laughs> I mean, maybe you, you may say, I mean, I, I was young, but I was like, okay, I'm already, I mean, they're 17, they're 16, and this is a youth group, so so what do they need? And and they taught me, they told me, as I said, Penny, we talked about this yeah. before, I mean, that they, they, they became my greatest teachers, and they told me what they need, what they want, and, and I discovered that there is no other place in the West Bank that can let, that can give the opportunity to Palestinian Israeli youth to meet each other. And then I started to understand, okay, so they need to meet each other, but what, what is our goal? What are we trying to do? We want to make change um, in, the, in the situation of the, of the partnership, or I, now I call it partnership, but, but maybe the interaction between Palestinian Israelis from its core, and how do we do that? How do we do that? So. So I understood that I want to create a space where I allow Palestinian, I give tools, practical tools to Israelis and Palestinians uh, to gain the sense of a, first of all, responsibility, but also capability of the ability to make change. And, uh, and that means learning about our identity to get, I, I, my belief, as I said before, is that that if you come with a strong sense of identity it's even e so so the interaction and the connection is even stronger so it's also learning about ourselves but also learning about the other side and being open to what the other side has to say it's also about doing community service and not only thinking about ourselves and and bringing these words into action and it's also about trying to expand the circles of change and talking to different groups and also having fun. I mean, <laughs> um, workshops, hiking trips, seminars, and things like that, that that allow us to create a strong group that uh, that are willing also to to be there for each other. I mean, and I have I can give maybe examples also of their of their personal stories of the youth. Um, yeah, but before you do, I think it's really an important part always with with communication there is the fact that 
you know, the Israelis often speak Hebrew or in, and English, and the Palestinians speak Arabic and usually not uh, anything else. And how you bring them together, I mean, uh, you have, uh, I believe you have translators that help. Can you talk a little bit about that? Because it it that's one of the greatest barriers, I think, uh, to start out with when you have these groups who live right next to each other and they don't even speak the same language and they don't interact. Yeah, it's, it, is, it is challenging, but I will say that it's also, it clarifies how, how much is invested for us not to connect. <laughs> yes. I mean, yes. on, on both societies. And once that's clear, so it's it's alarming and it brings you to action. I mean, for also for me, I mean, after the first year in Roots, I decided I'm gonna study Middle Eastern studies and Arabic, and that's what I've been doing for the past four years. And a great chunk of my life was uh, for the past four years was studying Arabic and breaking my teeth over it. And also, and I remember in the first and the second summer, also the, the youth, they asked me, to connect them with the teacher. And on their summer vacation, they came every day for three hours for almost three weeks um, to study Arabic and to study Hebrew. And it's not, it's a, so, so sometimes, I mean, and it, I mean, I, I, it, it is difficult to interact when there is no language. I mean, there is a limit to how close friendships can become when you don't have the language, but it does clarify, I mean, how, uh, important it is to, to to make all the efforts to create connection. So, how often were you uh, meeting and and uh, doing things together? And once every two weeks for a year. Most of the youth they're between sixteen to eighteen. So most of them, if they they came while they were sixteen, so they stay another year. Most of them stay for three years. And then they become like part of the team, like uh, elder brothers and sisters for the younger um, youth, also boys, also girls, and both sides. And uh, also, aside from these two weeks, I mean, every two weeks, so the youth themselves meet with the instructors a week before the session. And we have it like divided into different subjects. So we begin with our personal identity and then religious and cultural identity and then the narratives and then words to action. And we have like the end of the year project. And, but each of, this, of these subjects has different sessions, like five or six sessions. And the youth themselves, they will decide on the practical level what's interesting to them. And, and they have the freedom to say, I want to learn this in the religion, in the religious uh, subject. And maybe I, and there was a, a terror attack now and I want to talk about that. I don't want to talk about religion. It's, I mean, I'm I'm burning inside. So, so that also happens, and and for me, it's very important to give the youth the, their voice. So, so that does happen. So, can you uh, give some examples of what happened and how that was handled? Yeah, yeah. I mean, uh, actually, just I have an example for just uh, two weeks ago, uh, mm -hmm. a Palestinian. Uh, uh, that we, we have our sessions now on Zoom and a Palestinian young girl, uh, she wanted to share a video of uh, soldiers going uh, into her, her uh, school and throwing uh, gas bombs. And, and one of her uh, friends, it's, it's only girls that school, she, she got hurt in her um, shoulder. Right. And, and, th and that brought up I mean, and in Roots, we have like a rule that we talk about everything. And, and that brought out a very, very interesting and sensitive uh, discussion because, uh, and it was interesting because I, I saw it most affected the, the young girls on the other side and the Israeli side, because, and they, they, were, they asked her, but the, it can't be that the army just went in there with no reason. And then she said, yeah, because on, on the same, on that same street. Excuse, there is, excuse me. Are the sounds coming from your apartment, from your, um, somebody you else's? Yeah, we could, we could definitely hear those noises. No, no, is there anything? No, 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 no. 
Thank you. So, um, so, so they asked her different questions, and it was very interesting that for for me and, and to see that also the interaction between the girls that that her answer was sincere. She said, "Yes, we have Palestinian kids throwing uh, stones on the on the on, on the neighborhood next to our school, and we know that the the army needs to stop them, and they come and." And this is very, very difficult to handle because it's a lot of complexity. I mean, it's understanding that that we have to hold this this complexity and talk about it, and understand how difficult it is to take sides in that in that aspect. And I and I can share also another another story from the Israeli side. I mean, I had a, a girl calling me up uh, very late at night, crying because. Uh, a person, a guy that she knows, his father was stabbed in the Gush Etzion, um, um, how do you say, in the, in the Gush Etzion uh, section, and mm -hmm. uh, they have, there's there's like um, many stores in that, that area. area. It's, it's a place that many people go to, and it's, it's a, you feel safe when you go there. You feel, I mean, there's a lot of army, and that is where he was stabbed, and she was scared. And her parents um, told her, I mean, you, not her, I don't remember if it was her parents or uncle, aunt, I don't remember, but they, they told her, are you gonna be, keep meeting with your Arab terrorist friends? And, and that is very, very difficult. And, and we talked about it. And then she said something very sweet. She said that she heard that the, the guy that stabbed that, that man, he was 16 year old and from a, a small place in, uh, in Hebron, near Hebron, that one of our students is from the same place and also 16. And she said that for, for her, this is a motivation to keep coming to Roots because for her, she understands that also if you change even one person, so you're gonna, you, I mean, this suddenly this uh, sentence that if when you change one person, you can change a whole world, for her now it became something that, that really became reality. That's how she felt, and and uh, it's very very strong and very interesting to see what these kids are going through. So, would you say then that the kids, um, when stuff happens, that they can see beyond the incident, and uh, at this point, they try to support each other? Yes, I think uh, they can. I think. Uh, that they're that, that being so young, they have also a, they have a open heart and flexibility <laughs> that a, that allows them to also to hold their personal pain, but also understand that they want to make change and for change that you need you need to hold complexity. You need to to know how to listen also to things that hurt you, but then uh, be playful in the break. <laughs> I mean, they, they they have the ability to do this. The Palestinian kids who participate, do they have to keep it secret from, from their neighbors, maybe sometimes their family, because, uh, you know, associated with Israelis can cause them harm sometimes? Yes, actually, we, we, need, we really need to, for, for us, it's very important not to, not to publish their faces, not to publish their names. Um, because uh, right now, I mean, it, especially meaning with settlers, that that's considered nor normal normalization, mm -hmm. and, and that, that is, is considered very bad in, in the Palestinian society, and also um, in front of the Palestinian authorities. And so, so we need to take care of them. But we can see that they they are very brave. These young people. I mean, they keep coming. They bring their friends. They bring their families. And, and they believe that, and, and the circles expand. I mean, every year we have more and more youth also, also from the Palestinian side, even though it, for them, and it, it is important to say for them, it's a bigger sacrifice. They're really endangering themselves for this cause, but they, but they really believe this cause gives them a sense of meaning. They, they believe this is the, the way to make change. So, um... You don't have to recruit with them. The kids do it themselves by bringing people that they know. Yeah, I came to a point that 
two years ago, or I think maybe last year or two years ago, they told me, Raz, you, it's better if you don't come because it's, it looks better when, when we do it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I could, I, I could imagine. Um, is the um, Palestinian attitude when they first come in still um, so well, actually, both sides. All right. When they first start out, are they? Uh, do you end up with anybody who has uh, more extreme views, or does everybody show up more with a, a left, um, you know, kind of kumbaya, get, let's get along kind of attitude? What when they first start, are they um, pretty? uh read, pretty much ready to try to meet and be with the other side or is it a mix or who shows up and um, so it's actually it's, it's different on both sides and i will say on, Israel, on the israeli side many of them are rebellion young people <laughs> who come uh, against the will of their parents and uh, many of my conversations are not with the youth, but with their parents, <laughs> trying to convince them why, why they, they're sending their kids to this uh, crazy organization, to this crazy young, uh, young group. And, um, and they're very, and they come from very right-wing families many times, very idealistic families. Mm -hmm. um, even though I will say that with very open-minded parents and, smart parents i mean also if they're very right wing and they don't agree with uh with our our values and roots they i'm always very very impressed by their willingness to say but he's my child and he will find his way or she will find her way and for me i mean i'm not gonna tell him or her how to think they they can search their own path themselves this this always impresses impresses me um on the Palestinian side, it's a little bit different. The Palestinian side, they have to come from families that know no roots, <laughs> know the Abu Awad family, because uh, because for them, I mean, if their parents wouldn't agree for them to come, it, it would be practically impossible. And um, but they are, I mean, I wouldn't say that they are left wing. I mean, they have strong ideological perspectives and they believe in Palestine and they believe in their rights and independence. And so, so I wouldn't say that they're lefties, but they do believe in nonviolence. And this is, I think, the common thing for, between the, the Israelis and the Palestinians, that they all have a strong sense of belonging to this land. And many of them will say, even on, also on the Israeli and also on the Palestinian side, that they relate with the, the whole land of Israel or the whole land of Palestine idea. But they do understand that they have another value, which is the rights, the equal rights of, of people, and uh, and that and that might be stronger, and that is why they're willing to compromise, even though they see it as a as a value. And this is, I think, that the the new thing about roots. I mean, not many people see it as a contradiction, but they say no. I mean, we have different values, and sometimes we need to compromise <laughs> because these values. Um, can't come together in, in, in their perfect way. When, uh, have, have any of the kids or their families uh, with all of these attacks and things that happened gotten heard and and what was the reaction of the group? What, what happened? Or their neighbors? I don't know. It seems like yeah, yeah. stuff is always happening there. Yeah, so, so I did give two stories uh, before, but there was like a, a, another uh, la two years ago, we had a young Palestinian whose cousin was uh, was killed. And also, actually, a very strong story for me was on the first year of Roots, where a, a young Palestinian boy uh, lost his friend from school, a 14-year-old guy named Khaled Bahar. And uh, the authorities weren't willing to to give back the body for burial and that was very traumatic and I was I was back then I was sure that we're going to close the group down I mean it's not I mean uh, we're, we can't proceed after such a traumatic incident and not only that he came back but he was willing to talk about it to open up 
And, and I was so impressed to see the group supporting him and listening and understanding. And, and later on, that same guy, he stayed with us for three years and he had a, a surgery in, in Jordan and, he, and his family is not very wealthy. So they asked for, for help. And the people who recruited a lot of, of the money to, to pay for this uh, surgery were uh, the young uh, alumni from, from mm. Roots University. Yeah, I know, I know you've definitely had success stories. I know one of the people that I interviewed was uh, Bilal Arar, and he's, yeah. he's kind of a, a graduate, <laughs> if you will, of uh, your wonderful program. And uh, they also formed a, 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 a alumni group, I believe. Is that, that correct? Yeah, yeah, yeah. This year we went uh, forward with our alumni group, and also not only that, but the, the alumni two years ago established a, a young kids program uh, that also yes. uh, goes on uh, once every two weeks. And uh, and that was very impressive. And and. Uh, I think the most impressive uh, thing that happened is that while we had a, a field trip in the, in the past summer in August, mm -hmm. so we, we went to a small uh, a beach on, on the Dead Sea, and there we met a young man from Jericho. And he was so impressed when he saw our young, uh, young adults and, uh, and, uh, and the youth uh, mm -hmm. that he asked me later on if he can take my number and establish a similar group in the Jordan Valley. And, and, uh, and a month ago, we began our, our meetings and uh, we're already working on our third meeting. And we have a group of more than 30 young uh, Israeli and Palestinians from the Jordan Valley. So the, just, just to explain that's, the, the that's, power of what is their influence. Actually, I believe that was uh, Aaron uh, Avidor. Yeah, Eran Avido and Omar. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So he's actually who I'm interviewing next week. Um, <laughs> we're because your group is not is so new for the, for the younger adults. We're going to be uh, talking about his group of the um, Israeli settlers and the Bedouins, which was very enlightening for me um, to learn about. Uh, uh, another, a new group uh, that is also involved in this work, uh, as well as there are some Palestinians also who uh, participate with the Israelis. So yeah, so <laughs> you're, you are growing uh, your, yeah. your impact now th throughout Israel, <laughs> growing more and more, which is fabulous. Um, so after all of this and such a change from growing up and how, what, how, what is, uh, how have your opinions about Palestinians changed? What, what, what have you learned from working with them? Wow. That's a big question. Cause I have learned so much. Right. <laughs> um, I will say that I remember how in one of the first trips, with the youth inside Israel, we went through the checkpoints and Shadi pointed out a part of the fence where he was always jumping over when he needed to go to work earlier. And he, and he, was, he wasn't allowed according to his entry permit. Mm -hmm. and, and I think this was, this was um, a moment of shock for me because I, I remember how one of I, I remember that how I acknowledged the craziness of our of our reality. I mean, I told him that we might have met each other a few years ago and under different circumstances, and we would laugh about it, but um, and we wouldn't laugh about it. And uh, and that moment, I knew that I could never go back to the person I have been before as a soldier. And I understood that now I have a friend that that the dot on the screen was not a potential terrorist anymore. It was a was a flesh and blood and very similar to me and uh, my enemy became my ally and he was the one I shared with the, the deepest, the deepest fears and secrets, secrets. The, the one fighting for a higher cause by my side and and I think this is something 
the the sense that the experience of transformation was was something very strong for me because I think you there there's um there's a experiment that a, a social psychologist psychologist named Duran Halpern mm -hmm. uh, he researches the uh, communities and societies in conflict mm -hmm. and he learned about the Israeli and Palestinian conflict that we are desperate uh, societies because we cannot even imagine the the ability to create a different reality and and he says I mean the the basic um, definition of hope is the ability to imagine a better future and the sense of capability to achieve it and we do not and he said that one of the reasons we we, do, we can't imagine it because we do not believe in change we do not believe that the other side is even able to change and i think what i gain in roots every day <laughs> every meeting i have with the young with those young people and with my partners and my team is the evidence that change is possible. It's not something I have read. It's not something I have heard of. I have experienced transformation, first of all, with myself and, and later on with the people around me. And and maybe if we, if we can create more spaces that prove that transformation is possible, then then I, I really believe that more people will have hope. And if more people have hope, then they will have the sense of capability to make change and to make an active, an active uh, um, initiation to, to create that change. Do you have uh, 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 one of the stories of uh, one of the kids' transformations that you could share? Um, yes, yes, I actually, <laughs> I think um, that the, the main added value of our work was articulated by a, a, young, a young man named Duria Binun. He was a student and a graduate and a, also a former instructor of the Roots Children's Daycare. And he, and he said that in the past, we, he believed that the solution, that we need to find a solution in order for us to make peace with the Palestinian people. And, and after three years in Roots, he realized that we have to create peace between us first and then surely the solution will come. And, and this is something that very strong that stay, stayed with me because, and I think it, it teaches us a lot about right here, right now. I mean, also on the Palestinian side, I mean, uh, there's a, many, many, many Palestinians come and they say, no, you, I mean, you can't go to the army. You can't, I mean, that means you're not, you're not affected by roots. And, the, and then after a year with, with the Israeli friends, they understand we need to work with reality now. We need to create peace now. And if you're going to the army and if you live in a settlement, so I will make peace with you and I will try to be your friend and I will try. And, and when you go to the army and, and it's crazy, I mean, it's, it's, um, it's something that is, is very rare for a Palestinian young man to say, when you go to the army, take care of yourself and make sure that you treat Palestinians in, in a human way. And it's something that they would never say if they wouldn't have a friend from the other side. Yeah. Yeah. Well, for the last question, um, if you were speaking to the people of the world, what would the message be that you'd want them to know about your work on peace and uh, the communities you help? <sighs> <laughs> First of all, I will say that uh, that 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 a, a very Im important message for me is uh, is what I just said that Oria said that uh, that peace is something that you create now, and it's not created by a solution, and that nothing happens uh, overnight, <laughs> and uh, that hope is a contagious thing, and if we create if we learn how to create more uh, spaces of hope, and this is something we have learned from COVID, <laughs> that mm. uh, even one person can infect a great amount of people. And if we create more and more spaces like that, we can affect, infect <laughs> a great amount of people. Mm. Um, but, uh, but on the personal level, I think uh, my greatest lesson is, uh, is the understanding 
how to hold um, complexity. And this is something I have learned also from Rabbi Fruman. He, he used to always say that we have two hands, we have right and left, and that we need to use them both. And I think in Ruth, and this is something I want, I want people to, to try to understand also about their own lives. I mean, I have learned how to hold in one hand me being also a grandchild of Holocaust survivors and immigrant parents and a, an officer, a woman, a Zionist, a, a, a religious girl and, and the, the understanding that I have no other land. And, and I managed to hold on the other side the understanding that also Shadi and Bilal and, and uh, Omar and Rahil, that they, they also have a heritage and the same land, that they also have family here and beliefs and lives and that they also have no other land. And even though I do not know what the solution is, I do know that it begins with bringing them together and by meeting each other. And uh, this would be what I want to send to the world to create more and more opportunities for people and sides to meet. Fabulous. Well, thanks so much, Roz, for sharing your knowledge and experiences with us. Next week, again at 11 a.m. Pacific time. Now, we'll be speaking with uh, Aaron Avidor, as I mentioned before. He lives in the Jordan Valley, and he has a group that works locally on peace between Israelis and Bedouins and Palestinian communities. They've also just started the other group that Roz uh, was talking about, bringing together Israelis from the Jordan Valley with Palestinians from Jericho. I found it very interesting to hear about uh, modern day Bedouins and their interactions with both Israelis and Palestinians uh, in my pre-interview. And I'm looking forward to sharing Aaron's knowledge with our audience. To our listeners today and those listening to the recording later, thank you and may you live in peace, shalom, and salam.